this is part two of remote access to the Raspberry Pi using NGROC. Part one is an overview of what we're going to accomplish in this video. Here in part two, we're going to do the actual live coding. In the end, all the code's available in the GitHub repo. If you get yourself an NGROC account and download this repo to both your Raspberry Pi and your local computer, install the proper credentials in the environment variables, then you should be able to access your Raspberry Pi from anywhere in the world. First, we'll make our project folder. I'll make tunnel CD into tunnel, make it an NPM project, make it a Git repo. Of course, we want to Git ignore because we don't want to send on our node modules or our uh, environment variables, the dot end. So we're going to install ngrok, mqtt, and dot env. Dot env is what brings the environment variables into, into the program when it runs. And let's do demo.js. We'll start with a simple program to demonstrate that ngrok works. So for the environment variables, we're going to need two things right now. We're going to need our ngrok token. So at this point, you can go to ngrok.com and get a free account. And then it will issue a token. I'm logging in. I already have it. So you click on your auth token and then take that value and copy it and then go down and paste it into your environment variables. And the next you want to put your Pi username. And what this means is, you know, the Pi defaults to Pi as a user, but you're, it's recommended that you change that username for security reasons. So whatever name you have it at, I have it at Pi. I'll put that here so that we use that username to SSH into the Pi. Okay, so now I'm going to build out demo.js so we can see how this works. Let's confirm that our ngrok account is up and working. We're going to start by requiring the .env. This will bring in the environment variables, both our ngrok credentials and also the username that we want to use when we SSH into the Pi. Next, I'll bring in ngrok. Here's the options we're going to want to feed into ngrok. I got that from the npm ngrok page. So here you see we're going to bring in the environment variable. So now we're going to bring in our ngrok token. So this gets us authorization to talk to their service. So we're going to embed the ngrok code inside of an asynchronous function because we're going to have to await the ngrok connect command. So we're going to put inside an asynchronous function and get the URL that it returns and then console log that URL to see what we get. Then after defining the function, we want to call it so that we can actually make the connection and then lastly, we're doing a little bit of cleanup here. If you leave your connections open with the free tier, you only get one connection. So if you fail to close the connection properly, you may not be able to get in. Now, there is a way around that. If you have that problem, you can actually go to the web page, look for an open connection and kill it. But the best thing to do is always have some functionality here in the code to kill it whenever you're done with it. Let's go ahead and check out this demo. We're going to run demo to JS. And you see that we get a URL back. And after our three seconds, we're going to close the connections. I want to show you something here now because I'm not going to show you for the rest of the video. Whenever you close the connection, those will be closed off and you'll be able to use ngrok again. But it takes a while. I don't know how long it is, 20 seconds, 60 seconds. So if you try again to get a connection, it rejects you. This looks like there's a problem. I don't believe there is. It just takes them a while on their end to close off those connections and, and open you up to a new one. Like I said, if I, if I see this again in this video, I'm just going to delete it from the video. Um, just so you know it's there. Whenever you try to reconnect too quickly, you might get rejected. You know, considering that this is a tool you're going to use to SSH on rare occasions, whenever you actually have to talk to your remote Pi, it's not like you have to leave the Pi and then come back in 15 seconds later. So this isn't really something that is a problem, but it's good to know it's there. We have our connection back, but look at look at this format. Is that an SSH string? I don't think so. Here I'm gonna parse that URL into something different. And instead of explaining the detail on what I did, you've you've parsed strings before. I played around with it till I was able to pull out the values I wanted. I'm basically gonna turn this into a string that says SSH pi at some URL with a dash P, which is uh, an option to specify a port number. And when you take this ngrok URL and convert it into the string as I'm doing now, it becomes a line that you can copy and paste into the command line and that will get you your SSH into the Pi. Here we're using our second environment variable, the Pi username. Like I said, when you want to SSH in, it's going to be Pi at or root at or ben at. 
In this case, I'm going to pull that out of the dot env and insert it into the string that I'm building. So now with this new function, we can go ahead and enhance our output. We're not just going to output what ngrok returns to us, but we're going to we're going to output this parsed URL, and that will be an actual string that we can copy and paste into the command line and use. So here we go. You see the output has now been modified into an SSH string, and that's that's what we'll actually be using to access our pies. With that working, let's get off the demonstration and move on to the files we're going to actually need to do our work. For the Raspberry Pi, the remote device, we're going to want three files, app.js to do the quarterbacking, ngrok.js to manage our connection to the ngrok service, and mqtt.js to manage our connection to the mqtt broker so we can listen to requests and send our results. I'm going to start by pasting in the ngrok code that I just produced, and I'm going to modify it. I'm not going to go through all the detail. It's the same thing. For connection, we use await ngrok.connect, and to disconnect, we do ngrok.disconnect and ngrok.kill. Now, I'm going to put some console logs in here. I'm also going to wrap these in a try-catch, which is the um, recommended way to handle an uh, asynchronous function. I'm going to put connect and disconnect into our module.exports and then bring it into app.js. Next, we want to move on to MQTT. This part might be a little bit hard to manage. The purpose of the video was to show how to use the ngrok library. And part of that demonstration is setting up some MQTT routes so that I can, say, from my desktop, talk to a broker that talks to a Pi. That Pi gets some information and sends it back to me. Well. I'm now doing the coding, and the coding is specific to my MQTT connection. To the extent that you have MQTT available to you, you want to hear and insert whatever code you need to get that connection, and then return that connection to app.js so that it can communicate with the requester. By the way, if, if you happen to be running a Mosquito broker in the cloud somewhere, this code will probably work exactly as, as you see it. If you have questions about how you might tweak the code for your purposes, please send me a note. Now we can wrap everything up into app.js. We finished building our MQTT module, so we can bring it in here now. We're listening to requests from the user, which is you. So in this case, we want to subscribe to two topics. My broker is set up where all users are isolated by their username. So they can only publish to or subscribe to a topic that begins with their username. So that's a way to make sure that no one ever sees each other's work. In this case, we then have to take our MQTT user and inject that as a prefix to our route. So that's what you see here. It's going to be user slash tunnel slash connect and user slash tunnel slash disconnect. Those are the two things we're listening for to get direction from the user. That should be MQTT dot on, not dot once. I mentioned that the topic format is going to be username slash tunnel slash connect. All we really care about is connect or disconnect, the third item there. So I'm going to split that string with, by the slash and take the third element, which, of course, is element number two. If we get a connect, we want to await the result of our connect function, which is going to be a URL. We'll console log that here for our own reference, and we're going to publish that back to the user through MQTT. When we get the disconnect, we're going to do the same thing. Although here, I'll admit, I haven't actually checked to see what the disconnect returns, whether or not it gives you a verification that that actually occurred. I'm just kind of cheating and responding true. Uh, you're free to take a look at that and add some more debugging if you so choose. I'm just going to clean up the code a little bit here. Instead of writing that full environment variable name each time, I'm going to call it user, drop it in. And by the way, in each case, we're saying user plus tunnel, so we can actually just turn that into a single path and eliminate the word tunnel. Okay, then we'll clean up this once. MQTT once does not exist. Now we'll build the code that goes on your local computer that you'll use to generate the SSH string that you'll use to access the Pi. We'll start by creating OpenJS and Close.js. At this point, I'll start to go quickly through the code. I'm sure you're picking up on the pattern. In the case of Open, we're going to send out an MQTT, and we're going to receive back an MQTT with the URL. We then want to take that URL, parse it into an SSH string, and echo that to the screen. I want to copy in that parse code that we created in Demo.js. Instead of URL, we have payload, but payload actually comes in as a binary, so you have to convert it to a string, so we might as well just rename it URL. 
Also going to copy in the screen echo from demo. And you know what? If we're going to write this code twice, we might as well just put it into a separate module and bring it in. So I'm going to make a parse module, and then I'm going to pull that code into both demo and open. When MQTT connects, we're going to publish our message requesting a tunnel connect. Then I'll do my cleanup. So close is going to be even simpler. We just want to get our MQTT connection, send a message to request a disconnect, and then listen for that disconnect. In doing some review, I found two errors. You notice that the MQTT function requires a client ID. That's so that we can have multiple connections that will all have unique client IDs. So in app.js, we should provide that client ID, which I had not done before. The second thing is in ngrok, I have an extra C. Okay, so after making those two corrections, I upload this code to GitHub and tried to pull it down to the Raspberry Pi and realized that this was actually a raw Raspberry Pi OS image. There was nothing else on it. So I still need to install Node.js, GitHub, and PM2. Here's some quick notes on how I did that. Node.js and PM2 are straightforward. Go ahead and paste these lines into your Raspberry Pi and you'll get those two pieces of software. GitHub is obviously a little more involved. I don't know how you have your setup. I don't know what types of keys you're using if you've shared those keys with GitHub. For me, I have a key that I put on my Raspberry Pi so I can pull down software as I please. Do whatever you have to do to get GitHub working and then we can go ahead, install the software and try it out. Bring the software down, npm install. We have to set up the environment variables. You recall that I set up an a env underscore template. That file here shows some dummy information. Of course, you want the real information. So I'm going to move that into a .env, and then you want to sudo nano into that and edit the values so that you have your MQTT credentials, your ngrok credentials. Pi, the Pi username is for the files that are on our local computer. When we create an SSH string, we need that username to know which user we're SSHing into. The Pi is not doing that, so we don't need to leave that value in there. We pulled down the repo, we npm installed, and we set up the environment variable. So we're ready to try this out. Coming back to our local computer, on the right, the window on the right represents the local computer. The window on the left is the Raspberry Pi, which I'm SSH'd into. I type node app that opens the connection for the tunnel. And on the right, we say node open. And as expected, we got back an SSH string. If I copy that SSH string and paste it into the command line, we get an SSH connection to that Pi. To prove the point, I'm going to touch a file name. Now let's close the connection. You see on the left, disconnected. It echoed twice. I'll go in and change that in the code. And if we go to our, our home directory, we see that there's a file called arrived. We just successfully SSH'd into the Pi, exited, and that's it. Well, that's not it. That's almost it. The last thing is, you want to PM2 start this app and PM2 save. That means the app will always be running even after you close this window. So we can go ahead now, leave the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is still on, of course, and now the Raspberry Pi can be anywhere in the world. And you'll see that we can still node open and node close and get that SSH string. That's it. That's how you can SSH into a Raspberry Pi anywhere in the world.